I define AI as something that we can't do, something that helps us learn faster, um, but still in our own way. So it's a form of intelligence that's different from our intelligence. It might be more reliable, it might be more rational, it might be something else that's not like our own intelligence. And the second part of the definition is it is able to run on a computational substrate. So there, I think there are three building blocks of knowledge that's required to, to be in that position and to execute that role really well. One is past, one's present, one's future. The building block related to the past is learn some of the fundamentals about how intelligent systems work. And this is the fun part of this, which is you know reading books about the early days of neuroscience, the early days of starting to program computers, you know, in the 50s and so on. I think reading those books is one, a more entertaining way to come into this topic and actually a more productive way than reading some of the more contemporary stuff because the contemporary stuff is stuff that has a very short shelf life and doesn't really give you the principles of, you know, how do you build an intelligent system? Um, as much as the older stuff does. So that's the first building block, and that's about the past. The building block that's about the, the present and is a little bit more onerous to sort of get through or to acquire is making sure you're really up to speed with all the latest regulations. And so that obviously requires just reading a lot of the um, government material and getting a lot of advice from whoever you can get advice from around what you have to do um, in terms of storing data and running good systems and security, et cetera. And not just you know coming from government, but coming from any consultants you're able to, to bring into the fold on the security side. Now, the good thing there is there's not too much to know there at this point um, because these systems are relatively safe. They're not weapon systems or anything like that. Um, and you're not dealing often with biological um, systems or complex systems. They're pretty tractable systems, these AIs. So. That's the second bit, know what you have to know on the regulatory and the security side. The future bit is more strategic and that's sort of where my book comes into play, um, the AI First Company, which is understand how, okay, you can bring these principles and these regulations, these business needs, these other needs that we have in terms of our role in our industry and society and turn it into a strategy, a strategy to build products, hire people and whatnot. You know, again, whether you're a small business or a large business, AI is probably relevant to you. And that's the third building block, so to speak, to get to the point where you're actually putting something into practice. It's really simple, which is start with your own prediction problem. So start with an idea about or a hypothesis about a prediction that you could make that would allow you to get an edge. So if only I knew how much inventory I needed on my shelf on a Tuesday, I wouldn't end up with a bunch of spoiled inventory on a Friday. Or if only I knew um, how many days it takes to get something from A to B, if the weather's bad, then I will set customers expectations that they won't get their delivery by a certain time and I'll have less customer support costs or less perished goods or something like that. So think about something that in your business would be really good to know ahead of time, basically. And then you get to the point of, okay, well, how do I make that prediction? I've got a hypothesis. How do I run an experiment to see if I can make that prediction with some degree of accuracy that actually enables me to make a decision? And my advice there is start with statistics. Start with a small data set that you can just store on your own computer and run something like a regression over it or run something like a very simple model like a random forest model or something like that over it and see, huh, well, um, if I, I can make a prediction at this level, so that, that might just get you to some degree of accuracy that's low, like 60% or something like that, um, then maybe with slightly different method or with better labels on my data, so labels of like, you know, was this inventory pasta or bread, or, um, you know, did it come in at this time or that time, like better time stamps on the, on the data. 
I could get a more accurate prediction. And so then you try it again and again and again. So my advice is start really small, start with statistics, start with really simple methods, and then build up your AI capabilities one experiment at a time. And then once you get to the point where you think you've got it pretty accurate, that's when you can start thinking about, well, if I got a lot more data by buying it or forming a partnership with someone or um, collecting more of it from my customers, um, I would have a much, much better system. Or if I started using more advanced machine learning methods by hiring someone, I'd have a much, much better system. So only once you've run a couple of experiments are you in a position usually to make those more significant capital allocation decisions about where to invest next in your AI systems. So an AI first company is quite simply a company that puts AI first. Now then the question is, well, first in what? And it's first in conversations about strategy and then first in conversations about product. What are we going to build? Then conversations about people, who's going to build it? And then conversations about pricing. Once we build it and release it, how much is it going to cost? Conversations about distribution, about marketing, about policy, everything. And an AI-first company is one that has people within it, um, and ideally everyone within it, that are asking questions at the beginning of the process of developing a new product or undergoing a new initiative or hiring a new team. Like, well, how is this product going to generate more data that then informs something else that we do, another decision that we make? Or how are we going to price this in a way where it incentivizes people to give us more data that then informs the next product we're going to make for them? Or how are these people going to build a system that allows us to make more reliable predictions about our business or for our customers? And so that's what an AI first company is. It's, it's quite simply a company that asks questions about how everything they do will give them that leverage, that temporal leverage by building AIs and will help them learn faster by building things that augment their own intelligence, the intelligence of the people um, at the company and the intelligence of the systems that they use. Right now, what we can say is that the only trillion dollar companies on the planet are AI first companies. And those are quite obviously companies like Amazon and Google and whatnot, which is re remarkable. And I think in future, while all successful companies may or may not be defined as AI first, I think what is true is that to even have a shot at being a successful company, um, you have to have a competitive advantage. It's probably going to be the case that in any given industry, if you're not thinking far ahead, if you're not learning really quickly by using forms of intelligence that operate on computers in a distributed way all the time while you're sleeping beyond the capabilities of your own team, then it's going to be really hard to compete um, and be, be the number one in your industry. I think a lot of people today think about competitive advantage with the metaphor of a moat, um, or that helps them think about competitive advantage. And a moat being you know, something of a, of a fixed width that protects against competitors, um, enemies, and it doesn't change. It's a static concept. It's something like I have developed a drug and I've got a 20 year patent on that drug. So no one else can make that for 20 years. And I have exclusive right to earn money over that for 20 years. That's a moat. It's a 20 year moat. The thing about intelligent systems are that they provide an initial advantage because you need a certain scale of data to get them going and they need a certain amount of development work and maybe some you know proprietary software to build and they so there is like an initial advantage but what happens then is that they get a runaway advantage pretty quickly in a lot of cases because they generate their own data which feeds them again and helps them learn again, which helps them, you know, be more valuable to your customers, which means more customers start using it, which generates more data, which helps it learn even more and get even more accurate and so on and so forth. And so that's the loop. And it's helpful to think of competitive advantage as it's derived from an AI system as a loop rather than a moat because it's dynamic, because it increases in size over time.
There are so many weird and wonderful ways to get data. Um, there are lots of ways to generate data um, from consumers. So maybe release a side application, maybe go and buy data from a data broker that's been collecting data on consumers that are in your market. Um, there are lots of different ways to get data from consumers, give them an incentive to contribute data, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of different ways to get data from customers. So consumers being in the sort of B2C context and customers being in the B2B, the business to business application context. Um, so for example, you can write it into your contracts that you're allowed to use the data to train models, not reveal it to other customers you have, but you can write into the contract to, to do that. You can form a coalition among customers where they all agree to share data with each other and share the learnings of these models with each other. Um, uh, and you can form partnerships with uh, certain customers where they get special pricing, for example, in exchange for contributing more data that helps in the development of your system. So lots of ways to get data from customers. And one sort of one to finish with that's a little bit out there is you can build systems that generate data synthetically or sim run simulations that generate data, like little games that have an environment and you let actors play out in that environment and they generate data. So there are all sorts of other weird and wonderful ways to get data. But I think the, the point to make is a lot of them are right in front of you with your existing customers or consumers of your product. A lot of them are cheap. They just involve asking. And a lot of them are creative, as in you can find unique data sets that are not expensive or difficult to get if you just think creatively about how to, how to get them. I think the first thing to say is this is incredibly important whether or not you're building AI. Everyone is collecting data. Everyone is storing data about their customers in some way. And so, you know, the compliance question is one that comes before even thinking about it. Uh, building an AI system or being an AI first company. And it's really important to get your house in order, so to speak, um, regardless of whether you want to invest a little bit or a lot in AI. Then the question becomes, well, <clears throat> how do I do that? And of course, there are a lot of really good practices out there that one can adopt um, around uh, the very simple things, like making sure that access controls are good, making sure that the people involved are compliant in the way that they stick to those access control policies, making sure you have the right products in place to provide security so you know the stores aren't hackable, et cetera, et cetera. And then also making sure that everyone is obligated to uh, protect each other's data. You know, it's your data going to customers and it's customers' data going to you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so there are lots of different ways to do that. Then you get to the sort of next level of ways to do that, which is both um, really exciting and important uh, in terms of a field of innovation. So things like differential privacy, federated learning, and all these newer technologies that allow you to work with data without actually um, revealing the underlying personally identifiable or otherwise um, sort of not um, non-specific data. Um, and these areas of technology are still being developed in some ways, but in some, in other ways, they're very usable today. Um, and so that's the second thing you can do. Um, and I think the third thing to do is really think about how you generate your own data. Again, use things like synthetic data or simulated data. You know, again, this is an issue regardless of whether or not you're investing a little or a lot in AI. There are a lot of techniques coming out that help with this. Um, and then thirdly, there are a lot of techniques coming out that generate data that isn't connected to anyone, so it doesn't fall under um, any of the current protections that are required by governments. I think the first thing to consider is who do we have that has skills that may not be labeled as machine learning or AI or data science, but are actually the same skills, really, when you consider like their functional effect in building AIs. And so they are people with backgrounds from geology and glaciology through to physics, through to biostatistics, through to economics. You know, a lot of these people, you know, functionally do the same thing as data scientists in uh, their research or in their current role or in a previous role. And so 
the first thing to consider is who do we already have that is just very strong with statistics or something like that. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing as a manager uh, is to appreciate the nuanced differences between the roles you currently have and how you define them and the roles needed to be an AI first company. So there's a difference between a software engineer and a data engineer, an infrastructure engineer and a data infrastructure engineer, a product manager and a data product manager. And those differences are articulated in the book. But there are lots of slightly different roles that are good to have an appreciation of, either if you're transferring someone in category one into a a slightly different role than their current role, or if you're hiring from the outside. And I think the third thing to be conscious of is where you place these people and how they're managed. So, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you've got a very decentralized model where these people are placed in business units next to people that are, you know, on the ground every day and have no experience in data science, but have a lot of experience in the sort of day-to-day problems that show up in your business. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have all these data scientists and machine learning engineers centralized in one group that are like a center of excellence that people can pull on um, when they need it. And, you know, depending on your organization as it stands today or as it's structured today, and depending on the sort of problems you want to solve, the right model is somewhere on that spectrum. And it's not always at one end or the other um, for companies, but it's somewhere on that spectrum. And it's a question of, you know, how close you want the data scientists to be to the problem. I think it depends on something that is independent of being an AI first company, as in, you know, your ethical approach as a company or your your ethical framework um, is developed independent of your AI strategy today. And there's no reason why that system, that framework that was developed independent of your AI strategy can't be brought through or followed through into your AI strategy. And that is, you know, you know what you will and won't do for your customers, what customers you do and don't want to work with and why, based on what they, what effect they have on, for example, the environment or on society. And AI systems are no different um, in terms of considering like what effect they might have for your customers and therefore on the environment or society or otherwise. I think the challenge with AI systems in terms of applying an existing ethical framework to them is that they just operate in such a way where they grow in their influence very quickly, as in they can um, sort of get very, very um, effective very, very quickly and then allow your customers to make more and more decisions, um, put more and more product into the world more quickly. And so you've just got to keep more of a handle on it um, over time. But the starting point is probably the same as, you know, any decision about whether or not you'll take on a customer or not, whether or not you build a product. It's about what it enables and if you're okay with that. Again, it's a tool. And just like any tool, a lot of uh, AIs can be used for, for good and a lot of AIs can be used not for good. I think the first thing to say is any human design system will have human biases in it. And we have lots of systems every day, whether it's our laws uh, that are designed by humans in parliament or in courthouses um, or, or evolved by humans in courthouses or whether it's our policies at companies or whether it's the products we create. They all have our, our biases in them because we design them. Um, and AI systems are no different. Uh, they are, in a sense, designed. Um, the original features of a model, while they may change over time as the model learns, um, are often programmed by a human being. Now, the thing about AI, and the case I would make here, is that actually over t- time, they have a lot less bias because the initial programmed features of the model, the things we think are gonna be predictive of something, they change over time based on what the model actually sees. And this can go in either direction. They can get uh, to the point where they reinforce the original bias or they drift away from the original bias. And so that's the thing about AI systems. You've just gotta know which direction it's going in. And it could end up being the case that they have less bias than existing systems that you're using, hard-coded, rules-based, expert systems, or they could have more bias. Um, it, it really depends on the evolution of the model. 
And it also depends on what you start with. Some AI systems today actually don't have any human programming up front, and so arguably have no bias, so to speak. Now, they may look like they have bias because they converge on something that is not palatable and not okay. Um, but that's no one's fault in some cases, in the case of you know, what we call a completely unsupervised model, a model that just goes out there and does operations on data without any intervention by a human. Oh, oh, oh.